Hi all, Les Bowson here, clinical psychologist, fear of flying, other anxieties. It's the last weekend of February. It's been a little while since I made a recording, but let's have a go anyway. So last weekend, there was an interesting flight that went from Denver and then back to Denver. It was meant to go to Hawaii. And as I was watching my Twitter feed, one of my favorite apps called Flight Radar 24 uh, showed that there was a problem with the United 777, 777, 200 series, number five of the production line. So it may well have been used in the actual testing of all the 777 systems where there were, I think, four or five aircraft as part of that testing regime. Uh, and so, I, and in fact, I may have even flown on that one because I did fly a couple of times from Hawaii back to the mainland. Uh, on a United 777, so who knows? So let me share with you how this appeared. Uh, I'll put this up on the screen and I shall make myself uh, a little smaller so you can see. I'll just put myself over here, there we go. And we'll have a look and see uh, what this looked like. But you can see how the aircraft uh, was taking off uh, here from Denver and heading out, making its way to uh, the west coast of the United States, and then an incident happens somewhere around here, maybe even been here really, like really early, and uh, it made a longish return. And if we go to the YouTube page, you can actually see a number of the pages that YouTube threw up in the days after, some were from the ABC, NBC, CBS, some were from passengers, um, a variety of them, all showing this, what looked like a pretty scary sort of thing. And there's that image again from, of Denver, if I highlight this one here, uh, you can see here, the same kind of flight path that the aircraft took uh, in order to get back. But what's really interesting with this, if I can bring myself back to here, we'll leave this in the background for the time being, uh, this return flight. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, during the week, uh, a number of my patients that I was seeing over Zoom uh, started off their session saying, what do you reckon about that United plane? And I said to them, well, you tell me first what you made of what happened. And depending on where people are in their journey with me to overcome their fear of flying, there'll be a variety of different responses from my patients. People very early on, for whom safety is a big issue, we haven't yet quite got to be able to establish the relative safety of aircraft compared to plow, to trains and to cars and to ships and trains and just being in your own house. Uh, will say, see, that's evidence of just how dangerous this is. This is why I need to see you. Uh, other people much further along in their journey are saying, well, Les, can you tell me what you think happened? Why, how did this go wrong? So they're not necessarily panicked about this, but they are definitely curious about what happened. And so it just depends on where people are in their journey in overcoming their anxiety. Uh, that will determine their response. The patient that I have in mind most had been working with me for quite some time, and we were catching, after, uh, catching up after several months where she'd been doing a lot of flying on both commercial aircraft as well as small aircraft as part of her job into the Australian outback. So unsealed fields, lots of turbulence, and so that's what we had to work with, and she needed to fly several times a week, the nature of her job. And I said, what was your reaction when you had heard about this? And she says, well, I did, of course, see this online. And so rather than being static pictures, you actually saw the videos of this plane, much more uh, immersive, shall we say. And she said, I knew I had a choice to make. I could either look away and say, I don't want to know I'm flying tomorrow. I just don't want to know about this. Or I could look the other direction and say, no, no, I do need to know about this. I do need to reinforce that I think what I'm seeing here is an extremely rare event 
And just because it's possible that it could happen to an aircraft doesn't mean it's going to happen to every flight that I take and certainly not necessarily the next flight that I'm going to do because it's not going to be on a 777, it's going to be on a 73 and so forth. Um, may have been a different story if she was flying in another country on a 777. We have a lot of 777s that fly into Australia, uh, from uh, often from Middle Eastern air Airlines, uh, Air New Zealand, and there's quite a few, uh, Hong Kong Airlines, the Cathay, so quite a few 777s come in. Uh, not 200 series, mind you, they're mainly 300 series, which is the longer planes, and they're using, they're using different engines than the original engine on this flight, uh, which sort of prompts me to say that the engine on the, the one that we're talking about probably uh, is not, most definitely would not be after 20 years or 30 years, the, the same engine that was installed. One of the biggest changes and the most expensive changes, because these engines are worth six, seven, eight million dollars, is the engines uh, being changed. And then of course the tires, things that are in motion, that wear and tear, they're the things that get changed on a fairly frequent basis according to a particular schedule, which is either cycles, that is up and down, or number of hours is the usual arrangement here. Uh, I was curious, however, to share with you uh, one particular video, and I'm just scrolling here, and um, I'll, I'll show it to you here. And that's this one. Um, I wonder if you can see that now. Um, I have to get out of your way. There we go. So that's the one here, uh, which is a pilot talking about, this is this one here, a pilot talking about the checklists. And he says, what happened? A pilot's perspective. I'll make this uh, a, a little bigger. And then I'll make me uh, a little smaller. Let me get out of the way. There we go. And so you can see here, and it goes for what, 16 minutes and what, and it was recorded uh, not long ago by Captain Joe. It's already five days ago from the day I, I'm making this recording. Uh, 1.8 million views. People really want to know about it. Uh, some of whom might be fearful flyers, but some who are, who are in fact, uh, commercial pilots and, and pilots in training who want to know, well, what does a commercial pilot bring to this? And so this is a very important thing. Um, for me to discuss. I'm not going to play it. You can go and see Captain Joe's um, site. Uh, you can see what it's called, United 328 Engine Failure. What checklist did the pilots use? Explained by Captain Joe. So um, that's something for you to, to go and look up yourself. The, the question is, at what point in your journey of coming to terms with anxiety, possibilities and probabilities are you at now? And I'm reminded, when I was running a fear of flying program for a now defunct Australian airline, uh, we would do it each Thursday night for about five nights. And then on the sixth day, or the sixth meeting, we would actually take a flight to Sydney uh, on a 767 usually, wide body to Sydney and back. But on, the, um, on one of the Thursday nights before we went, uh, each night, by the way, each Thursday night, 7.30 till 10 p.m., uh, we would actually go on board a stationary aircraft and explore some things and sit down. Sometimes there'd be a, a pilot on board or an engineer or a cabin crew member explaining various things. And we might go and practice doing certain things on board the aircraft. You know, Things that nowadays I do using um, my VR um, equipment, such as my, my Oculus Quest. So we can do things like that now. Even By the way, even overseas, if you have one of these things, we can actually sit up if you're in Los Angeles. We can actually set up, if you've got a quest, we can actually set up a, a VR a clinical session with me here in Melbourne. It's great how technology has changed. But back then, no, we had to, we were able to get on board the real, the real McCoy, McCoy pre-2001 without too many um, uh, security hassles, hassles. But we did it. Uh, and on a, one Thursday night, usually very late in, the, um, in our training, maybe the fourth or fifth Thursday, we'd actually got on board the plane. They would lock it up. And this plane was usually going down to the hangar, which was about a two-mile trip along the tarmac, towed, not powered, towed down there. Uh, and it was going into the hangar either for an overnight check or maybe for a big check. And uh, checks on board planes are like, um, uh, you know, your 1,000-mile check after you bought the uh, car and then a 10,000-mile, 20,000-mile. And there are certain things that need to be done because parts need to be changed over, oil and so forth. Uh, planes, it's called an ABCD check, the D check being the big one. 
but basically you know, years of service, the engines are taken out, they may even be replaced, at least they're checked, and, and really going through the planning in microscopic detail. Often the seats are all taken out, they may be replaced with new ones, they may be put back in, but all things are changed on a D-check. The plane may in fact be out of service for several months because it takes that long. So one night when we went down there by bus, uh, sorry, when we went down there by, um, by 73, there was a big 767 of ANSET, that was the name of the aircraft airline, sitting there with all of its pieces. The engines were over here, uh, the cowlings, which is what blew off on the plane on the 777 were over there, seats were all lined up here, all sorts of things. And somebody says, there must be a lot of parts here. And the chief engineer, uh, called a LAMI, Licensed Aircraft Mechanical Engineer, or, or yes, mechanical, we'll do that, LAMI, L-A-M-E, said, oh, there's more than a million parts in one of these planes. Of course, not all the million parts are taken, <laughs> are taken off the plane like a, a puzzle set, um, but there are lots of parts that have to be put aside and checked. But there's a method to this, and uh, the, part, the engineer was able to say, yeah, it looks a bit complicated, doesn't it? But everything goes back, everything's checked, and then it's double-checked, and in some cases we triple-check everything to make sure. You can't just leave it up to one person. You put that in and we'll, we'll hope for the best. Uh, I did have a chief pilot acquaintance who worked for another airline, Qantas. And his job here in Melbourne was whenever an aircraft came back from a D-check, uh, one that he was licensed to fly, and he mainly flew 7-4s, uh, he would take them up for a spin and check out all the systems uh, after its big D-check. Sometimes they happened in Sydney. Sometimes there were small ones that he flew, A330s and 73s in Melbourne, which he was qualified to fly on. So that's how it works. Now, if we would have gone down to the hangar with this plane in millions of pieces, well, in lots of pieces, early in our training, before people had learnt about safety and aviation, safety culture, people probably would have freaked out. Said, oh my God, this is just the worst nightmare. This is what, this is what I didn't want to see. But four sessions or five sessions in with lots of learning about safety culture, this actually reinforced how safe aviation was. So for you, depending on where you are in working through your anxiety about flying, last week's events in Denver may either reinforce, what am I doing, I don't want to do this, or if you watch Captain Joe's video and others similar to that, you would see your notions of safety being reinforced that things are happening. I do have one small um, uh, extra thing to share with you. So I'm going to, this is live, so I'm going to go looking for it now. And I think it was from an acquaintance of mine called John Astrauer, was his name. So I'm just going to drag it over here. There we go. It's a tweet that he sent. Now I have to get out of the way. So this is a tweet that he sent, uh, a recent tweet. He says here, I'd like to share the context in which I watch this clip. And that's the clip of the, of the engine in, on fire and doing its thing, which would send some people to their knees. He says, the video is genuinely amazing. Well, I think across the board, we can agree with that. Uh, the investigation is in its early phase as well. We are only a week in, but the consensus would appear to be that two blades on the big fan at the front came away. We don't know. You know, mental fatigue, we don't quite know how that happened, why that happened, but we do know what happened. Uh, but what's illustrated here is the incredible power of integrated redundant systems informed by history, driven by data and regulatory guardrails. And what he's getting at here, if I make myself a little bit bigger, is the level of redundancy that's now built into aircraft based on past experience going forward. So this aircraft incident is not the very first time that it's ever happened and someone's gonna, no one's going to say, oh my God, we're into new territory here. There is an investigative process and you may realise that all 777s owned by United were grounded and other airlines quickly followed suit that if I also have 777s with that engine variant, uh, they were also grounded pending inspections. So it's a little bit like a car recall for seat belts and whatever else, but it's done really quickly. That's how aviation moves forward. So I, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, write some comments below. If you want to ask questions, I'm around. I will answer questions and I'm going to be putting up another video very soon 
about some new evidence about turbulence and how to manage it. So I hope you'll find that interesting very soon.